Hello, fellow Gritizens. Do you believe in your ability to navigate life's obstacles, but you're not always sure where to start? Well, lend me your ear, because here on Grow My Grit Podcast, we gather strength and inspiration from real people navigating real obstacles in real time with grit. I'm so grateful for the chance to connect guests and listeners who are ready to know, grow, and show their grit, perhaps best described as one's default settings in the face of obstacles. With our individual grit compass as our guide, one of the biggest opportunities available to us is identifying the strengths we already possess and we reliably bring to challenging situations. These insights into ourselves and into others allow us to explore obstacles with renewed passion and purpose. Are you ready? Welcome to Grow My Grit Podcast. I am so excited to have you as a listener. I'm excited to introduce you to today's guest. We have with us Kim Alexander, author of Creating a Safe Space in the Classroom, a Guide for Educators. She's also a high school teacher in the greater Toronto area who is committed to her students' mental health and their grit. Kim, welcome back to Grow My Grit Podcast. I'm so excited to hear what's new in your life. Thank you. I'm excited to be here too. (laughs) Fantastic. So just for people who haven't met, you haven't heard any of your previous episodes, I'd love for you to remind us of how you define your grit, your G-R-I-N-T words that capture your default setting when things are hard. Well, it is always in flux. So I like your grit format that it always changes, but I do come back to certain words. Uh, So my G is gratitude. Mm. My R is resilience. My I is intuition. And my T is trust. Ooh, those are different and still really powerful. Awesome. Now, I'd love for you again, just again, speaking to each one individually, does one kind of jump out at you? Is, Is one really, really powerful for you right now? I think always the gratitude is very powerful. Mm. So I have a gratitude journal that I write in every day that's been a practice that I've had for years. Um, And just I find that really helps me be mindful during my day to be always looking for things that I can Mm. be grateful for. And especially when things are not, um, you know, going my way or I feel that they're not, this focus on gratitude is something that really helps me. Amazing. Thank you. I love to bring kind of context into the conversation and then put the conversation in a broader context. So as a teacher, you've done all kinds of amazing things for your students. And this past semester, you offered the inaugural Black Voices in Literature course at your high school, and you faced several obstacles along the way. I'd love for you to tell us a bit about the course. Yes. So that's something as well that I'm very grateful for. So that fits in with the gratitude. Mm -hmm. So I am teaching it at my school. It's the first time that it's being offered. And I do need to uh, acknowledge all the teachers in my school board that worked on this um, and fought for years to get it started and developed the course Mm -hmm. um, so that I can be somebody that teaches it at the school. So it is a grade 11 course. And so it follows the regular grade 11 curriculum. Uh, Students get their grade 11 credit. It's a different focus in that all of the authors that we read are all Black authors. And the issues that we speak of would be issues that have to do with um, the Black community and uh, assignments and everything are geared towards students' experiences. That sounds like an amazing contribution to your students' experience, to the board as itself, and just really to humanity, that opportunity to hear from others who have been there and just who are there now. That's a great context for that. Thank you. You're welcome. I really want to pull into your previous experience just to really make sure that everyone knows how much you've offered the listeners in the past and where we're going from here. In episode 12, you shared practical tips on growing our confidence with our grit. And I'm curious, which of your grit words was driving your confidence for making Black voices a reality at your school, knowing that it's been offered in the past, but just in terms of you offering it at your school, which of your grit words was kind of driving your confidence? I feel like a few of them were. So definitely gratitude. The first thing I did on day one was thank the students for signing up because one of the conditions on offering the course was we can put it out there that students can make a choice. But if nobody signs up, then, you know, we Mm. we are unable to run it. So I thanked my students for um, signing up for the class because it is an option for them. They could have just taken the regular English, 
So gratitude is something. And also there's been so many days where I've written in my gratitude journal things that have happened in the classroom that I'm grateful for in terms of uh, learning something new myself or having students engaged, yeah. um, even creating resources, which is a lot of work as well. Um, but creating this has, has made me very grateful in a lot of ways. Um, another word that I found I've been using this year is also intuition. Mm. So there is some fear not having lived experience at all in presenting things to students and making resources. And I've been trying to just kind of use my intuition in that way and think, you know, I think students would like this, so let's go for it. Mm -hmm. And always being open to feedback from students. Uh, I did tell them right at the beginning of the course, if we do an assignment and you're not really into it or we're reading something and it doesn't really resonate with you, please tell me. Because we can always switch it up and I, I'm always open to making things different because I really want the course to be about student voice, mm -hmm. which is something that um, we should focus on. So just using my intuition to create things that I think will be interesting for students, um, but then also being open to their feedback in any way that they have. Amazing. And what I heard in your answer is really two things. Again, that sense that, A, you were grateful to the students. It isn't just recognizing that other teachers have built the content, but that you took time to thank the students for showing up for the class. Not everyone will actually acknowledge that element that the students had a choice and that it may have been something they weren't sure what they were getting into, yet that in itself was an effort. So it's always nice to be thanked. So I'm sure the students were grateful that you were grateful that they were there. And then again, your openness to feedback from students, not all educators, not all figures of authority are always receptive to or interested in feedback from their constituents or their stakeholders. So it's amazing that you were again able to, from the beginning, say, you know, this is as much for you as it is something I'm offering to you. And I really am prepared to hear your experience may be hard for me to hear, maybe something I have to work on, but just openness to feedback was, I, I appreciated that in your answer. Thank you for all that. And they have given me a lot of feedback that I am grateful for and that I can change and uh, for future classes. It's hard to teach a course the first time. Everything is new. And for the students as well, it's their first time with me taking this course. Mm -hmm. So everything is new for all of us, which is nice that we're kind of on this journey together. Yeah. And again, that's an obstacle in itself is that novelty that, you know, I want to make this available. I know what I'm expecting. I know what I'm hoping and really just showing up for each other in that community, which is again, really hard to do, but equally important to do from a place of grit. I love it, thank you so much. And then going to episode 19, you had actually offered guidelines and strategies on making space for grit in the classroom. And as you delivered your course and really listened to your students, what are some of the obstacles that they identified that they're facing? And how do you think your course is gonna support them along their journey? One of the biggest things, and I did share this essay with you um, in September, was there's an educational essay about um, windows and mirrors in school and that it's important to have both, um, but to think about what we present students that's a window for them. So where they're looking through a window to see somebody else's story, but also that we present them with mirrors where they're seeing their own experiences reflected. And we actually did that essay in September with my class, and I introduced them to that uh, theory and that topic. And we talked about in school, what have they encountered that's been a window for them? What is, uh, have they encountered that's been a mirror for them? And not surprising to me, but sadly, um, the students in the class that is primarily Black students have had more mm. windows instead of mirrors. Mm. And so one thing that I really wanted to do in this course was to present them more so with mirrors. And so going out and trying to find different resources to do this has been um, maybe sometimes a little bit of a struggle because I'm creating everything. There's not really much that has been created. So trying to find all that has been something that's taken a lot of time. But as I build everything up, you know, in the next coming years, continuing to teach this course, that will be much easier because I have a bank of things. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something. And what I've really liked, too, is when I've presented them with the novels that we are doing, the poetry, the essays, the debate topics, the media unit, um, 
they're really seeing themselves in so many ways that that maybe I didn't expect. Mm-hmm. It's not just that the author's black voice is there. It's it's the topics. It's the language that's used in the novels. It's the food that is eaten in the novels, the cultural mm. um, issues, mythology, um, everything that is spoken about in the fiction and the nonfiction that we're doing resonates with them in many different ways. And I've been so happy to, to find that. Um, something else that uh, I tried to do is in terms of discussion, to have very difficult discussions sometimes mm. and just facilitating that and trying to create a safe space where they can discuss uh, whatever is coming up for them in that space and not having any boundaries to what we can talk about. Yeah. Many times during the course, I've even had to maybe encourage them mm-hmm. to speak about about things. They will often hold back. Yeah. And some of them have told me that they hold back because in other classes, if they've spoken up about a topic or their own experience they don't feel that they're being heard Mm -hmm. so in this class there's been many times where i've said you know we can we can talk about this even though it's challenging or even though it's difficult and then waiting yeah and sometimes i wait and i think oh should i you know stop the waiting as time goes by but then slowly they they do feel more comfortable to share um And then maybe another uh, kind of boundary was I had to get over my fear Mm. in a lot of ways. I was very scared sometimes to maybe bring up a topic or to present something that I thought would be a great resource. But as a white woman, it wasn't a great resource. So when I present things to students as well, having to use one of my um, great words, intuition, to just say, you know, this is this is the essay we're going to read today, or this is the poem we're going to do today. But please let me know, you know, if this is not what we want to do, then that we won't do it. And really trying to have them interact in the class more. Mm-hmm. And again, what I'm hearing from that context is that you're essentially creating a space for your students to hear that the creators or the people offering the content sometimes are equally invested in it going well. They don't know how it's going to roll out, but to speak to your element of fear that, you know, I'm not sure that you will receive the message I'm offering, but I'm going to check in. I'm going to really make space, even though I'm scared, like just that whole element of really everyone is concerned or everyone is operating from, I don't know how this is going to go. And so that modeling of When I'm afraid of doing something or saying something, it's not that I'm not going to do it. It's that I'm going to offer up my concerns as well as my thoughts. And I love that intuition is your I word because that's a community experience. So as much as my lived experiences may not match those of my students, as a human being who knows the value of being seen and recognizes the value of being part of a community, I would imagine that this is going to resonate. And then even though I've imagined I'm going to check in, with the people I'm providing this to, to see if that which I imagined reflect their experiences. So what I heard, just to really summarize, is that you've helped your students, A, see themselves in a mirror through the content, but also connect with an individual who is providing the content, but is equally kind of questioning the content and just needs validation. So you've made yourself vulnerable in a different way than they have. But everyone is doing hard things. Yeah, I love that, that we're all doing hard things in this course. Yeah, we are all doing hard things. Amazing. And then another time you were here, episode seven, you emphasize the importance of creating and maintaining boundaries when we do hard things, but also creating and maintaining boundaries tends to be its own kind of obstacle. So you touched on this a little earlier, but um, what kind of boundaries did you have to set while you were developing and delivering this course for the first time at your school? Um, Some of the things that I had to think about was how much would, I guess, I lead the class and how much would I let students lead the class? At the very beginning of the course, I told them, um, you know, I'm the expert in the curriculum. Yeah. You know, that's what I've been trained in. I know what this course needs to teach you in terms of skills. Um, But in terms of lived experience, they are the experts. I have none. So trying to kind of balance that out where Mm. there's certain things we have to do in the course from a curriculum perspective, but also, um, you know, being very open to taking a lot of detours along the way. 
And one of the things we did in terms of a detour, and I remember I shared this with you, was when I found out that students really hadn't had a lot of mirrors in children's literature, I went to the library and I took all these books out that were fantastic books by Black authors that had Black characters. And we spent a whole day where they read kids' books to each other. Mm -hmm. And for many of them, they hadn't read a kids' book before that reflected their experiences or themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very, and it was an emotional day for me because yeah. growing up for myself as a white woman, I had lots of books as a, as a child that I read mm -hmm. um, and they hadn't. So some of them even took pictures of the covers. They said they were going to mm -hmm. buy the books for younger cousins or brothers or sisters. Mm -hmm. And many of the books are just so beautiful. So that's a little detour that we took away from the curriculum when I noticed uh, that there was a need. Um, something else that I do is trying to give students as much choice as I can. Mm -hmm. So we do a big project at the end of the year, which actually we did before Christmas. And I had different options and I presented them all to them and, and had the students pick. And I was so happy because not only did they have the opportunity to pick something that resonated with them, they also wanted to add more to the project. Yes. So they wanted to do more work. And I hadn't expected that, but of course I, of course I allowed them to. Mm -hmm. So for example, one of the projects that linked to the novel Icarus Girl that we did that takes place in Nigeria and uh, it has a mythological element to it. Yeah. So I had asked them to do a project where they would research um, Nigerian mythology and then incorporate it into a media project. And I had asked them to research one character and I had students ask me right away, well, can we do more? Because we want to make our, <gasps> our project a little bit bigger. So, of course, I said, sure, of course you could research more. <gasps> um, and one mm -hmm. particular student, and this made me emotional, asked if she could also incorporate a Nigerian fairy tale that her mother told her growing up oh. into her project. Mm. And I said, of course you can. You know, that would be absolutely beautiful. And I think she got one of the highest marks <gasps> on the project as well. Yeah. So students really resonated with the, with the projects. And then I was so pleased that they wanted to do even more. Yeah. And so always saying yes to when they wanted to, to do something like that, um, even though it wasn't maybe what I had planned, yeah. but allowing them to do that as well. And um, something else we did was teaching them a little bit about assertiveness, even though it doesn't really go with the mm -hmm. curriculum. But in, you know, speaking to myself, they can speak up um, if something isn't uh, resonating with them, but also in other areas of their life as well, mm. uh, to speak up. And that's been a conversation many times as things go on in, in school. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And I just love the smile the listeners can't see, but the smile on your face, I'm feeling it through the screen, just that sense of the opening of possibility for students, A, again, tying back to the mirror to see yourself in the literature, but then to see how that reflection is something you immediately want to share with other family members, something you immediately want to get a bigger mirror. Because what I'm hearing is that your students kind of said, well, that is an amazing insight and I love what I'm seeing, but I want to see even more. So then the mirror is like a window into another element of their own experience. It just sounds so empowering and tying back to that sense of boundaries that, you know, we create this curriculum, we create this sense of what is possible, but as the learning, as a growth mindset, you've essentially given free reign to, I will modify as you grow because I didn't know where you'd be or I didn't know where you'd take this, but this is for you at the end of the day. So boundaries are made to be expanded in the name of growth and in the name of, again, more connection. Yes, that's excellent that you said that. I love it because the curriculum is a boundary. You know, there's certain things that I, I have to teach mm -hmm. um, in order for them to get the credit, but how I go about teaching those skills yeah. is very open. So you're right, working within the boundary, but also... Um, being very flexible in how in how we get there. So, for example, if we have we have we have a poetry unit, and we have to write some poems. Mm. That's the skill that that is in the curriculum. But how we write those poems, or how we express those poems, or the different poets that we read, that is something that um, can have a lot of creativity in that. And uh, some of the poems that they made were some of the best mm. that I've I've ever read. Yeah. 
Oh my goodness. And again, some of the students may not have come into the curriculum expecting to be a poet or to have discovered that skill set. They may have had one mindset of, well, a poet is someone who's really stuffy or really, really creative and really flowy, and their work is only published in this setting. But again, you've broken into a potential boundary of what this word, what this career path, who knows that that person may have finally experienced the freedom of expressing his or her feelings or his or her thoughts and might end up a poet <laughs> somehow. Yeah, I yeah. had even a few students say to me, I didn't even know there were that many Black poets. Oh my gosh. And of course, the ones I presented to them, I thought, oh my gosh, we only had time to do so few. Um, but even those few, the students expressed that they hadn't even known there was that many, which really reflects their school experience from kindergarten to what is now grade 11, mm -hmm. that they have not... Some of them have done no Black poetry. Oh my God. Some of them knew, um, you know, a few names, yep. but that's it. So this course is really an opportunity for them to see a lot of mirrors in terms of what they're reading. Mm -hmm. And it's really in increased their appetite for more of what is out there. And again, that sense of, I didn't know this was a thing, but now that I know it's a thing, I'm going to find even more of it. There must be a forest. There must be a community. There must be. So you sparked something, planted a seed where it's just this stuff was here before, um, that sense of I don't know what I don't know. So again, you've invested in the current curriculum, but made learning even more than it was before these students came for your course. I hope so. Oh my goodness, I think it sounds that way. And then what I love, just as a really pulling in, is that in episode six, we really talked about mental health for teens. And so much of what you've discussed so far has supported the growth and the intentionality and the intuition of your students. But I'm curious, what insights would you like to share with other educators who may want to offer a similar course at their schools to support their students' mental health? I've, when I was thinking about this question, I wrote actually as a note in big capital letters, uh, go for it. Mm. So if you are thinking about starting a course like this, just do it. Yep. So yep. just try to do it. And every school will have different steps in terms of how you um, put forth a course to be on the curriculum. But definitely I would put it forward and then I would start to promote. And what I did to promote was I went to individual classes in grade 10 and told students about it. If it's just on the course calendar, many won't even know what it is. So I was trying to promote it as best I can. Um, and then as you can imagine, in a high school, word travels quickly. Mm -hmm. So once I started going to classes, um, I heard students talking about it. Students came to me to ask questions about it. And it kind of went from there. Uh, I'm really proud that we have two sections of it at my school. So one this semester and one next semester. I'd also tell teachers to be prepared for a lot of work. It's hard to do a course the first time. You will have to create a lot yourself. Yep. So any assignments you want, any resources that you need, um, any tests. So for myself this year, sometimes I've laughed and the students have um, been completely okay with this. They'll ask, oh, are we having a quiz? And I, I kind of sigh and I say, well, I didn't make a quiz. So no, we're not for this unit. <laughs> um, and they're quite happy. Uh, next next semester, I will mm -hmm. have a quiz, yes. maybe. But um, just trying to create as much as you can and also to educate yourself. So I'm speaking as a, a white teacher. Um, a teacher of color may have a different experience. But I know for myself, I really had to, to research a lot of things. So in the novels that we did, for example, um, the one I mentioned before, Icarus Girl, takes place in Nigeria. I didn't know much about Nigerian culture. Mm -hmm. So I had to research that. I had to make sure that um, things that I was going to talk about or, or present to the students I knew about. Yes. And many of the students themselves didn't know. So then I had to think of this, okay, as a white person, I am presenting information to them mm -hmm. when they are from Nigeria. Yeah. So um, because they hadn't learned about it in school. So trying to be very careful about that. Uh, I'd also say be very humble mm -hmm. and accept feedback. And if a student tells you, you know, this assignment I don't really like, or it's not really resonating with me, or even, um, you know, you said this in class yesterday and it, it really, you know, didn't sit right, mm -hmm. to be prepared to 
just say, I'm so sorry, and I will do better next time. And really try to be careful about um, about things that you do and say in class. Even if your intentions are good, um, it can still create harm. And to encourage students that they can give you feedback on anything that happens in the classroom. Yeah. And I really just want to pull that theme in again, creating a safe space, which ties to your book, essentially what you are doing as an educator, whether you're a parent, whether you're a teacher, just to make this a broader context is that creating that safe space for people to be comfortable to try hard things and do hard things and say hard things is really how we connect. And it's up to the people who are in charge of responsible for offering the content or the instruction or the learning opportunity to always be present. To It's just as hard to be the student as it is to be the person educating. And we are consistently teaching and learning at the same time. So obstacles come in all shapes and forms. But education is a very unique context because everyone's always learning. And it's up to us to know where we are in our journey and that other people are secretly infusing their experiences into our journey as well. Something else I'd add is um, if you are thinking about teaching this course is to also be prepared that some people, whether it's other staff members or administration, may not um, understand why the course is needed. And so to be prepared to fight for that and be prepared with an answer, because you, if you are asked, why is this course needed? Yeah. You can't just say, well, because it is. You have to think of reasons why. Um, and there will be people um, who don't think that the course is needed. Mm. And so you have to kind of be prepared for that. And um, that may come from, as I said, colleagues or administration or even other students yeah. who really don't understand why a Black Voices course is needed. Not surprising to me, the only people that did not really question at all are, are the uh, students who are taking the course which is why they've signed up. Yeah. And I did put a proposal in for the grade 12 <sighs> Black Voices. So I'm still waiting to see if that will be approved. Um, but the students in the grade 11 course are very interested in, in continuing in grade 12. Oh my goodness. That is an amazing way to conclude our chat. Really just looking at the hard things are everywhere. And as we co-create hard things to make it safe, there's a next level. So just when you think you've completed a hard thing and you're pretty sure it's going well, there's this other hard thing because the students, the learners, the people who have been touched by your efforts are now looking for, hoping for, encouraged by the potential for more. So to follow your own message, go for it as you develop and make this learning possible for your students. Thank you so much for coming back to the Grow My Grit podcast for your fifth adventure. I love that about it. And again, for listeners, please check out, if you can, at your earliest convenience, Kim's book, Creating a Safe Space in the Classroom, A Guide for Educators. Thank you, Hayes. You're so welcome. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. <laughs> Grow My Grit podcast, hosted by Hayes Shepmeyer, is a production of Gritty Guru Company. Technical production by Niall Fines. Music by Peter Willis. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify. For more information about my book, Know, Grow, and Show Your Grit, Self-Discovery Made Simple, please visit growmygrit.com. Follow me at Grow My Grit and share this podcast on social media. Leave a review, take a screenshot of the homepage, and send it to friends or family members who will benefit from more grit.